So welcome to today's episode, which asks the question, how do you solve a problem like Will Self? Um, now, well, there's sort of two sides to Will Self. Uh, there's a the novelist, which uh, I will go on in due course to talk about, but there's also the uh, cultural and uh, social ubiquity that is Will Self. Um, sort of in the 90s, uh, before sort of the internet became an everyday thing, uh, you didn't really know what authors looked like. Um, no one knew what um, Don DeLillo looked like, uh, unless they happened to be the subject of a BBC uh, arts and books documentary. Uh, but that's not the case with Will Self, who was very canny and uh, sort of appeared here, there and everywhere uh, beyond uh, the pages of his books. So my first encounter was on a uh, 90s uh, spoof quiz show called Shooting Stars, where he was one of the regular uh, panel contestants. Basically, Shooting Stars, uh, which Americans will find utterly bizarre, um, was two comedians called uh, Vic Reeves and Bob Mortar, who were hugely successful at the time, who had a sort of strange take on a sort of throwback comedy to what we hear in Britain called Variety, but in America you'd call Vaudeville. And they basically did their shtick on this sort of, uh, within this sort of quiz show setup. And um, Will Self was this sort of brooding, heroin-sunken-cheeked presence who uh, sort of um, always looked like he wasn't participating, wasn't joining in the, 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 the sort of fun of these guys. That He was above it all. Um, but he has this sort of amazing speaking voice, which is a slightly transatlantic, uh, uh, twinged, uh, received pronunciation, because uh, I think his mother is American. One of his parents is American anyway. And um, you had the sense that this was sort of Satan's vice gerent on Earth, um, that it wasn't the two comedians who were presiding over this show, um, but it's actually they were the court jesters to Satan himself. Um, so that was the first encounter. The second time he cropped up in one's consciousness is when, during a British general election, uh, he was a journalist uh, covering the election and he was flying on the plane that was transporting the then Prime Minister John Major to some constituency battleground. And before the plane took off, uh, Self uh, disappeared into the toilet to uh, shoot up and was discovered doing this and was thrown off the plane. This sort of caused a huge uproar. Um, but it's quite impressive to have someone shooting up heroin on the Prime Minister's plane. But anyway. Um, but Self cleaned himself up and uh, then did a, a round of uh, appearing on other sort of TV shows. He did Have I Got News For You, which is a sort of topical news satire quiz. Uh, he appeared uh, on the BBC Parliamentary uh, Question Time, which is a regular sort of Thursday evening uh, discussion with different uh, MPs from each of the parties uh, in front of a live audience who get to pose questions and all that sort of thing. So uh, Will Self was was sort of, you know, out there. You knew who he was, you knew what he sounded like. And then uh, finally, his final sort of incarnation, of the present one, is uh, he's all over the internet. There are some fantastic videos of him talking about the state of the novel uh, in the digital age. Um, what he calls the Gutenberg mind, which is people of his generation, my generation, who were brought up with books. And all that, how that now is all being sort of... Uh, the likes of us won't be seen, you know, the the, the human mind will not be uh, the Gutenberg mind, it will be some sort of digital version. And he points out how in the First World War, during the during the breaks, um, the British officer classes in their tent, they were all sat there smoking pipes, cigarettes and reading books. That's what they did. And of course, you had all the war poetry that emerged out of the First World War. And the, you know, that, that doesn't ex exist anymore. That's all broken down. And he poses the question... Um, why would novelists continue to write for a medium, the book, the print book, that no one reads in anymore? And uh, Self is quite sort of, uh, he's not really threatened by this. You know, for him, it's like, well, literature will still persist and whatever will be, will be. I really recommend you, you check out his uh, YouTube videos uh, about him speaking about the, 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 the sort of the, the current state of literature and, and the printed word. Uh, there's also a video of him um, uh, talking to uh, Zizek, uh, the sort of philosopher and social critic. And they're obviously mates, but it's a brilliant video because I think Self takes Zizek down as the fraud that he is. Um, you know, Self is, 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 is murderous to him in, in the interview. So that, that's really worth 
worth watching. Anyway, so that is Will Self outside of literature, but it performs an important function for two things. One, it keeps you in the public, keeps him in the public consciousness, which obviously will help support his books, people reading his books. But the other is, is his voice. And I don't just mean the, the, the physical quantity and sound of his voice, but it's the tone. Will Self has a slightly sneering, derisive tone. And that was first evidence of the quiz show, Shooting Stars. And it's important to bear that in mind in his literature. So we're going to come back to that. OK, so to the books in itself. So he started writing in the 90s. And um, I guess I was probably reading him in, in the early 2000s. And I found his early, early novels impenetrable. When I used to go on holiday with, with my wife, uh, I used to just sort of pack sort of nine novels uh, and I would sit by the pool and, and just plough through them. Uh, but for some reason, for for a couple of years, I ended up with Will Self, a Will Self novel in amongst those nine. And that slowed proceedings down because, as I say, they were just so dense. So Cock and Ball, um, How the Dead Live, Great Apes, uh, My Idea of Fun. I mean, I read them all and I got nothing out of them. I just couldn't. I couldn't grasp them. But the reason I kept going back to him is because his short stories were very good. So Dr. Mukti and uh, Tales of Other Woe, The Quantity Theory of Insanity, Tough Tough Toys for Tough Tough Boys, Grey Area. Um, you know, there was, a, there was a lot in the short stories. And I suppose his start, well, an obsession that constantly um, appears in his work is psychiatry and mental health. Possibly because of his upbringing, as I say, I think his mother was a uh, was a shrink. Um, but it's really for him a metaphor about the modern mind, the modern mindset, and the style. It definitely he's definitely a satirist. So something like Great Apes um, is a, is is a sort of a, a grotesque sat satirist, a bit like sort of uh, Swift's Gulliver Travels. But I struggled. I really struggled. I couldn't. I couldn't get into these books at all. And I think the turning point came with uh, his book, The Book of Dave, which isn't a great book, but the one thing for me was it was accessible. I understood it. I could follow it. I could find my way into it. And it's basically a book about um, a British working class uh, taxi driver whose life is sort of falling ar apart around him. His wife's going to leave him, take the kid. And he sort of commits all his sort of feelings to, to paper. You know, his sort of frustration and rage and, and all of this. And 500 years later, that book is discovered and becomes the uh, the, the, sort of the, the holy text of a, a religion that's built around it. And again, satire. Um, not, I mean, British writers seem, seem to have a, a difficulty with class, economic class and social class. And um, the worst... Um, Offender in this is Martin Amis, who wrote a book called London Fields, in which one of the main characters was a darts player called uh, John Self, ironically, since we're talking about Will Self. And it's just the most caric, sort of, you know, hackneyed, cliched version of the working class. And in a way, the book of Dave sort of veers towards that. But what makes Self far superior to Amis is Self's language. Self is much more playful in his sort of grandiose language. So he uses sort of grandiose literary language to describe sort of uh, quite sort of working class um, person and, and sort of situations that he gets himself into. As I say, it's still a bit cliched and hackneyed in the concepts behind it, but it's uh, certainly more successful than Amos. But that book was a key turning point for me and Will Self because I thought, OK, maybe maybe I've matured, uh, maybe my sort of reading uh, literary abilities have developed over the years. Uh, I'm not reading them around a pool in Portugal or Italy, uh, which probably helps because these are urban stories uh, in urban settings. Um, so I sort of I was going to persevere with Will Self. And that brings us up to uh, his last three books, which are a trilogy. And it, they are a brilliant concept. So the first one's called Umbrella, which I've read. The second one's called Shark, which I haven't read. And the third one is called Phone which is the sort I'm going to base the rest of this on. And the trilogy are all linked in that each considers a war, the pathology that spikes because of the war, and the technology. So in Umbrella, he looks at the First World War. Uh, obviously, the technology is the sort of industrialisation of that war and that war process. 
and uh, the third and uh, the other factor is the pathology, which is a, a spike in uh, uh, an illness called uh, encephalitis lethargica, which uh, if you've seen the Robin Williams movie Sleepers, uh, it was that disease where people are basically uh, instead of being locked into their bodies with their minds alert, it's almost like their bodies are sort of fine and functioning, but they're locked into their minds. They sort of can't escape a sort of mental state of their minds. And um, that sort of premise of linking the technology, the war and the spike in mental health is, um, I think, a supreme achievement. I think it's 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 a brilliant analysis of 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 sort of modernism modern life uh and where we are today so that's sorry that's the first uh book that's umbrella the second one which i haven't read shark is uh the second world war the dropping of the bomb on hiroshima and nuclear uh nuclear sort of uh mass destruction and the uh, disease that's considered there is schizophrenia and uh so i haven't read it but uh, my understanding is it sort of deals with the ideas of rd lang the psychiatrist who basically said well there's no real there's not there's not a sort of uh unitary uh, th- uh pathology called schizophrenia or any of these other sort of mental illnesses you have to treat the individual because it's so diverse so varied and he almost sort of got to the point of saying there's no such thing as mental illness it's just a different perception of reality a different take on on the world uh, and then the third book foam so this war is uh, the second invasion of Iraq, uh, which in Britain was certainly uh, uh, deemed by a lot of the public as being an illegal war that Saddam Hussein didn't have weapons of mass destruction he could call on in 45 minutes. Um, and the patho- the technology is, is the phone, but really all things digital. And the, the pathology he looks at here is um, senility, Alzheimer's, um, and, and and there's also a stream of autism which I'll I'll come back to as well. So those those that's the. So uh, sorry for that edit. I, uh, there's so much to say on Will Self that uh, it's hard organising your thoughts. Okay, so um, the style is is sort of modernist, and with Umbrella that's particularly apposite because of course that's uh, sort of First World War is the sort of uh, time of flourishing and modernism of Joyce and uh, Wolf and and uh, all that Beckett was sort of later to come, um, and I say it's modernist because there are very few paragraphs in um, in Umbrella and there's no paragraphs in Phone at all. It's a complete sort of run on stream of consciousness, but it's fragmentary, it's associative, and it's what you call enjambment which in poetry is where uh, an idea runs on beyond a single verse, even though there's no sort of syntactical indication of that. And with Self's um, style here, you get a lot of that, where mid-sentence it veers from whatever the character's thinking into an associative thought, maybe uh, um, sort of sparked off by a song lyric, a scene from a film, um, an advertising jingle, uh, you know, and it just sort of, moves around like this all the time in jambment so you're basically getting page sort of page long text about an idea but there's all these other things sort of springing off it but they all return to the idea as the thought process sort of you know coheres and comes back to to, to what it's trying to to fix on so um i'm not going to talk about umbrella that much because i think phone encapsulates everything that umbrella does but but basically what it is is uh, dr zach busner who is a psychiatrist or as self calls him an anti psychiatrist, um, and Z- Busner appears in many many of Self's books, even some of the early ones in the short stories as well. So he's a sort of constant companion of Self. But Busner in Umbrella, with a colleague, discovers uh, the roots of what he what he uh, believes lies behind this illness, uh, encephalitis lethargica. So there are two types of uh, manifestations of the symptoms. One is, as I say, it's sort of a locked-in sy- sy- um, syndrome where patients are basically catatonic, but they are doing slight motions with their hands or whatever, which are very, very slow. And then there's another version of it, which is the opposite, where it's sort of they're constantly ticking, constantly moving the whole time. And Busner hits upon this brilliant idea of he films them, he videos them, and then for the sort of catatonic ones, he speeds up the film. And for the sort of manically sort of moving ones, he slows it down. And that way he sort of dissects what the motions that they're doing are. 
And what he finds in the case of uh, one particular woman is that um, she is doing repetitive mechanical motions. And he finds out, uh, so I should say that, as in the film Sleepers, by um, um, prescribing the, the drug dopamine, grad he brings all of them out of this, their, 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 their encephalitis. Um, but the problem is that the, the dopamine wears off pretty quickly and they return to their, their, their states. Only they're worse off because now they've had a glimpse of, you know, oh, I've, you know they've been a, sort of fully functioning and that's been taken away from them again. So it's really tragic, just as in the film Sleepers. But what Busner discovers with one particular patient is when she's brought out of her catatonia, uh, um, yeah, catatonia uh, is that she's doing these mechanical movements when and she tells him that during the war because obviously men were, went off to the front to fight a lot of women went into the munitions factories and she comes from a family called the deaths or deaths um, who owned a munitions firm and uh, those motions that she was doing very very slowly were the repetitive motions on the turning lathe when she was making some military armament and in doing so, sort of the mixture of, of the mechanical repetition of, of, of these actions and the war itself being such a great sort of trauma, that's what she's got locked into, that her body has become automated, has become part of the, uh, the sort of the uh, production line, even though she's no longer involved in that. You know, she's like many women, as soon as the war finished, she was booted out of, of, of that, uh, that factory. But she's been locked into the motions of it, and it's a it's a brilliant it's a it's a brilliant insight, really. Um, but the thing is, it's a long book, as is foam like this, and you get an awful lot of the stuff about her family and the munitions uh, procurement and and all of this, and you get Busner's retrospective looking back on on you know his time dealing with the these patients and it's only really the last few pages that you get this insight which brings together the three themes of war technology and, and pathology and you have the same thing in phone whereby 600 pages of this sort of fragmentary associative text and uh, i'll get on to what the what the sort of narrative streams are and again, it's really only in the last 30 pages that it's all pulled together and the point of it. And I think this is problematical and I'm going to go into that into more detail. So that was Umbrella. So Phone basically has two uh, storylines, two narrative lines. The first is Busner is retired. He's in the early stages of uh, Alzheimer's. So his memories are going. And it opens with a sort of, you know, grotesque comic scene of he's in a hotel in Manchester, he's naked and he's in the breakfast bar and he's got his uh, organ out uh, hovering over the sausages. So, you know, it sort of echoes uh, the uh, shape of the sausage, uh, which is typical self. Um, so his story throughout is obviously, uh, you know, these sort of fragmentary memories uh, throughout his life versus the fact that he's losing his memory going forward. Now he has a uh, a son who has schizophrenia, who's a very minor character, uh, but it's more his daughter-in-law, Camilla, who not only has to cope with this schizophrenic husband who's repeatedly sectioned and very, very difficult to handle, and an autistic son, or a seemingly autistic son called Ben, who is a bit of a, a sort of tech savant, and Ben sets up uh, a link with his grandfather, a literal link, by giving him a smartphone and sort of pre-programming everything that his grandfather will need. And it's like they have this sort of link, not only the phone link, but they've sort of linked sort of emotionally in as much as the autistic boy, you know, can express emotions. And it's in a way that the, uh, the autistic boy is sort of helping his grandfather sort of persist. He's preserving his memories and his, you know, awareness of appointments and where he needs to be in transport on this phone this phone is a sort of a life giver to his his grandfather so that's one half of the of the narrative uh structure uh and the other is uh, a, a member of the de Eith family from uh from umbrella called jonathan who is a spook an mi6 uh spy 
Uh, for Americans, MI6 is the equivalent of your CIA. It's the sort of uh, security services concerned with external uh, foes and, th and threats. And uh, the nature of being a, a sort of MI6 agent is that you don't have a core existence because all the time you're adopting these what are called legends, you know, these storylines, these backstories, which suit the situation you have to go and, and sort of uh, do your espionage in. And his whole life is constructed like this, so that there is no real inner core. So even though De Eeth is, uh, is homosexual, he uh, sleeps with women as part of his, his cover story, as it were, as well. Um, and he has this long-term... Uh, uh, affair or love of his life with a tank commander uh, in a regiment called the uh, Fighting Rams based in Yorkshire. Now the tank commander uh, can't come out as gay because A it's the army uh, in the uh, 2000s um, when it still wasn't really permissible and he would lose his commission. Uh, also he'd get absolutely uh, mullered by his uh, you know, his sort of homophobic uh, soldiers, you know, that whole sort of male machismo thing. So he's sort of slightly unhappy because he has to stay in the closet. He's married with kids as well, uh, so he would break up that family. And part of how he's got his commission is his father-in-law basically is was an important person in the army. So sort of, sort of uh, nepotism there, and that would go, you know, that would be destroyed as well. So he's sort of bound by societal sort of restrictions as to why he can't come out. But for Jonathan de Eeth, it's different because um, as a spook, it can't exist, you know, this sort of real life with the, with his, his gay lover. But it doesn't exist. So he has no, you know, they, he, they can't buy each other sort of gifts. They can't send each other cards. You know, there's no record of it because they can't be. Um, and it's difficult for Jonathan, you know, this sort of one core of sort of, real humanity in him he can't express because they have the you know long-term affair but it doesn't exist because it can't exist it can't be acknowledged um which is a really interesting tension um so those are the two now oh and basically de Eeth, uh has sort of you know he's the main focus of the relationship and um the tank commander gawain he does sort of get sections, but it's basically Jonathan's perception. And he, as a spook, he's very good at reading people and, uh, and manipulating people. Um, and he has this prodigious memory. You know, as sort of espionage gets more and more sort of, you know, te te technologized, he refuses to, to, to go by it. He relies on this, on this memory. It's a really important contrast to Busner, who's losing his memory and has to have it preserved by technology, that Jonathan shuns technology and he says, no, it's all locked up under here, it's nowhere on paper, except returning to the uh, the affair. He has a sort of secret stash of, of, of uh, sort of records where he has written down, he's committed it, because he wants it so desperately to exist in reality. And it's in it. He puts it in a suit in a briefcase, and he keeps moving this briefcase around to sort of save drops, to save drops where no one can get their hands on it. And towards the end, he mislays it, and I'll come back to the implications of, implications of that. But basically, De Eeth's, um fragmentary uh, stream of consciousness is about so many things. It's about past missions. It's about his family it's about when he goes and stays with other people um you know as part of his cover story to appear sort of you know legitimized it's his relationship with the lover it's getting hold of drugs because he's addicted to drugs um another sort of modernist device but one that's been done a lot to be fair is uh he has a sort of uh his penis has a personality of its own and, the, and they sort of communicate and stuff um so that's that's sort of his fragmentary narrative. And there's a lot more associative stuff for him than there is for Busner. He's the one who has sort of, you know, uh, jingles and clips of songs. Um, and what's interesting for me is because this is sort of set in 2000 and I'm roughly the same age as Seth, maybe slightly younger. I recognise every single reference for the first time ever in a self novel. I recognise every single reference. So this advertising jingle, that TV programme, that news story, that song lyric. So there's a Joy Division lyrics in, in the early section of this. And I'm a huge Joy Division fan. It's like, wow, you know. Um, 
and on that level, I sort of felt quite, you know, this is the apotheosis of, of, of for me of, of sales writing because I got, I didn't have to look up anything. So that was great. But there are problems throughout with this book, as I think there are in, in all of uh, sales books. <coughs> now, the first thing is, as I say, you really only get the revelation tying together the pathology, the war, the technology in the last 30 pages so you get this sort of unending remorseless relentless text with no paragraphs for six just under 600 pages and it's all of one pitch and it's only really when it veers off in the last 30 pages that that you get any kind of modulation at all so on the one hand you've got this sort of huge variety of of, of associations and fragmentations um you've got Characters that are very different from each other. You know, Busner is not the grandson, is not Camilla, is not Jonathan, is not Gawain the tank commander. They are genuinely differently drawn, but they all have the same voice. Not Camilla so much as, as a woman, but the others all have the same voice. And that voice is Will Self's. Now, by that, I don't mean the author's voice. It means when I read it, I hear Self narrating it. Now, partly that's because he's put himself out there and we know what he sounds like. But the point is the tone particularly of Deeth, is sneering, scornful, disdainful, derisive, as was Will Self on Shooting Stars. And you get that for 580-odd pages. This, you know, this is how he looks at humanity, partly because of his job, because he has to read people and sort of root out which ones are the dangers and stuff. And he's very down on what he calls sheeple, you know, the norms, how we live our lives, uh, you know, dreadful in his eyes. He, you know, he's beautifully tailored and coutured. So he sort of, in his own mind at least, he can stand, a, even though he can't stand out too much, in his own mind he can stand out from these people. So there's a problem, this sort of monolith of tone all the time is just, you know, and the style is monolith. Even though it sort of flies off and veers here, there and everywhere, it sort of always comes back and then it flies off again. It's doing this page after page after page. And the, the combination of those two make it really problematic, I think. There's no modulation in the novel at all. Um, so that's that's one problem is 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 the sort of is the tone. The second problem is um the autistic character turns out not to be autistic. He in a way he comes into possession of, of Jonathan's briefcase and and you know is going to use the information collected there. He, in a way, is a spy master running Jonathan because he's got something over him and he can sort of bend him to his will. And that's, you know, that's a very interesting sort of plot device. But it's problematical because self is sort of talking about pathologies. And here he's, here he's sort of portraying to us an autistic boy. Um, but he's not. He's he's using it as his own legend and I think that's sort of morally slightly problematical that self is so good at sort of um, nailing pathologies and sort of mental conditions here is using one as a device and I think that's problematical but it's all f it's all for part of his sort of greater reason he introduced uh, me to this fantastic word I've never heard before I'm just going to I've got it the definition of it here OK, and that word is uh, anosognosia, which is uh, defined as a lack of insight, a symptom of severe mental illness experienced by some that might impair a person's ability to understand and perceive his or her illness. It is the single largest reason why people with schizophrenia or bipolar disorder refuse medications or do not seek treatment because with anosog <laughs> anosognosia, you don't think you're ill. So why would you need medicine and stuff? But uh, Will Sell's point is that we are all uh, agnosognosiacs, um, that we society who think we are the norms, we are the mentally ill if we think that, because of war, what war does to us. War is an abomination. War is, is abhorrent. But we sort of accept it as part and parcel, even though the British public didn't accept the uh, the Second War invasion of Iraq. Um so there's an interesting bit where um, Busner uh, 
re, uh, um, quotes uh, the uh, psychiatrist D.W. Winnicott, who's uh, someone who I studied at university and I'm very sort of uh, beholden to his um, his works, although I hadn't come across this, where when Winnicott's talking about schizophrenia, he says um, the difference between schizophrenics and other people is that schizophrenics don't use metaphor. They, when they talk and they think and they describe what they see, for them that is reality. They're not embroidering it through through metaphor like we might. And in a way, that's that's sort of <coughs> sorry, that's sort of key to to this this whole this whole perception that self has is that we are all mentally ill by that definition and i think though i haven't read shark this is the key thing about rd lang who's who sort of i think permeates shark as i said that there isn't really a sort of mental illness pathology it's just a different way of seeing and i think the winnicott um quote sort of fits into that so that for self we are all mentally Ill. how dare we sort of uh, prescribe a thing called mental illness or mental pathology uh, when you know we don't see it in ourselves we are these uh, anosognosiacs and, and that is self's point and, and I think that's you know it's fascinating and it's brilliant but it's taken him a strangely pacey meandering which is a, a sort of an oxymoron but that's what it is um, 580 pages to get to that point as it did in Umbrella to get to the, the analysis of um, Encephalitis Lethargica. And that's problematic. This is why I say, how do you solve a problem like Will's self? Because, you know, all the tools of brilliance, are, literary brilliance, are undoubtedly there. But they don't quite cohere and come together to deliver the perfect novel, uh, the perfect Will self novel. And, you know, you wonder, who's he writing for? Not that he has to write for anyone. He, you know, he can set up his own set of problems and solve them with each novel he writes. He doesn't have to write for readers. Um, but he makes it so hard and always has made it so hard for readers. I don't think he cares. Um, so, for example, in phone, acronyms are spelt out phonetically. So the purpose of an acronym, is, which is sort of uh, economy, is 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 detonated into the completely the opposite fashion it's um so mp would be uh or gchq would be g-e-e s-e-e -E, um uh, g-c-h as in h-a-i-t-c-h and then q as in q-u-e-u-e -E. so it's expanded it's the opposite of what an acronym is supposed to do and it makes, you know, you have to think when you read the acronym, what, what's this referring to? And of course, there's hundreds of acronyms in the security service branches, in the military. And throughout this book, it's peppered with, with acronyms and it just makes the job of the reader harder. And I think I think that's absolutely deliberate by self. It's not justified. He doesn't sort of at any point say why that is other than this is how Jonathan thinks. Um, and that seems to be sort of symptomatic to me of, of what self's up to here. Um Having said that, having said that it's sort of it's a monolithic text, of course there are brilliant bits of writing that sort of you know sort of jar you out. So in phone, there's a whole section where um, where uh, Gawain, the tank commander, uh, he's commanding a, a British post, and they've they've taken some Iraqi uh, prisoners to interrogate because one of the the soldiers was shot, and they're trying to find out who did it. And it's this brilliant section where there's all these sort of people he has to talk to you know has the doctor examined the prisoners yet he's talking to the interrogators you know you can go so far but don't go over the top uh the number two guy is basically sort of had a breakdown and he's sort of trying to sort of you know sort him out and the guy rounds on him and sort of says oh you only got your the the the, the commissioner's head of this is because of the nepotism and you're gay and you've tried to hide it everyone knows which is a revelation to this guy Gawain um so there's all this stuff going on but what's really brilliant is that inanimate objects are given voice so the metal bar that the soldiers sort of bang the interrogators bang on the on the concrete to sort of intimidate the iraqis that has a voice um Gawain as yeah Gawain has sort of got a computer that he's trying to sort of you know get connectivity on the base and there isn't any and it's just that buffering circle so there's a sort of dialogue between that and the buffering circle and Gawain and there's just all these other voices not human voices at the same time as the human voices and it's it's just a stupendous piece of writing there's another section in the book where um 
Busner invites a, the elderly Busner invites a prostitute up to his room and ends up giving her a, a gynecological examination at her request. And again, it's just a brilliant section. But at the same time, you've got a section whereby Busner has basically had an intervention by his family and they want to sort of send him off. They know he's sort of, you know, he's losing his memory and they want to send him off um, to a, an old people's home or, a, you know, somewhere for a, a site, you know, people with Alzheimer's. And the compromise is, is that, he is going up to a Buddhist retreat, a Buddhist retreat on Holy Island in Scotland, and as part of that journey, he he sort of revisits his his time as a as a trainee uh, doctor in Edinburgh. Uh, but for some reason, he, uh, two of his London patients are on the train, and I couldn't quite work out whether they'd been sent there to accompany him to make sure he got there, or they just unilaterally, you know, happenstance happened to be there. But none of that made sense, and, and that whole section of him sort of uh, casting back in his memory to his relationship with them. It just didn't work. So again, you get the sort of, you know, the pros and the cons. But I do want to say that, you know, there's some brilliant, brilliant writing. So uh, here's an example about uh, Jonathan De Eve's attitude to, to uh, Y2K, the fears that the world was going to collapse with sort of digital madness. Disdaining such a stage Saturnalia, He'd sat at home and listened to the evil buzz which vibrates through his house while watching the festivities on television, half hoping planes would indeed fall out of the sky. For what fitter solution could there be to humanity's great third act problem than a digitally induced mass suicide? Oh, oh you know, that's sort of stunning. Or uh, uh, Ben, the uh, supposedly autistic boy, um, he sort of goes around when he does sort of go out, he's sort of hooded up and you can't, you know, you can't really see his face and all that. Um, but when there's a scene where he's sort of his head is emerging from the hood to talk to his grandpa, Zach, and it's described as like uh, emerging out of a foreskin, you know, great stuff again. Or um, here, another former imperial power will have in the modern idiom abandonment issues. You know, he just nails stuff like that. But, you know, it's it's slightly sort of pearls uh, in amongst a sort of vast morass of, of, of sort of seawater. Um, and the final thing I want to say about it, and this returns to the sort of the, 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 the one pitch tone of, of, of a book like this. I've seen self interviewed on uh, on YouTube where he says basically the moment he stopped being a supporter of the political left in in England, was the Iraq war, the, the so-called weapons of mass destruction, which never existed. And uh, from that point on, he's just sort of, you know, he's 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 left uh, the, the British Labour and socialist movement. Obviously, you know, to reach such a pitch, he was steaming angry. But you don't see any of that in here, even though the analysis that he makes of pathology, war and technology is 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 beautifully analytical and reasoned. There's no anger behind it. There's disdain, there's scorn, but this is not the same as anger. And this is the thing with satire. It's very hard to get satire pitched just right. You know, you want to convey a, a, a discontent with the things that you're satirising. Uh, but if you go too over the top, it's it's sort of sledgehammer satire. And if it's too subtle, then although it may hit its targets, the emotional power isn't behind it. And this is the thing with the, these self-novels. They absolutely dissect many of the woes of modern society. But they do so, I can't say dispassionately, because they're scorn and derision, but they don't do it with heightened or proportional emotion. They, they, you know, it's that thing of, of being at the, you know, on the fringe of a school playground by the bike shed, smoking illegally when you're not supposed to smoke, and just making barbs about all the sheeple in the rest of the playground. How you're implying you're better than them without saying it, but just sort of putting them down and stuff, which is fine, but it's a very cowardly sort of the the, the equivalent of a sniper. And it, I, you know, I think it falls short of delivering that knockout punch that I think self wants to deliver. 
Now, literature cannot be enthralled to sort of political messaging. It, you know, it loses its subtlety, it loses its finessed analytics and its nuance, which is the, you know, the meat of literature. So somewhere there is a balance to be struck between the passion behind what Will, Will Self wants to say and, the, and his literary talents, which I don't think dovetail sufficiently with the passion that he so clearly feels. And this is the problem for me of Will Self. He has not written that ideal, even in his own terms, Will Self novel. There's so much to admire, but they fall short each time. I will continue reading Will Self. I will certainly continue listening to him on YouTube if he puts up new content. Um, but he remains a bit of an enigma. So <clears throat> even though this book, I got every single reference, hooray, um, it still didn't quite hit home for me enough. Um, but here's hoping. So Will Self, I salute you, but I just think, come on, man, just get over that line. Just produce your perfect novel. OK, um, so till next time. Thank you.